I got uh, more than five hours of sleep because no complaints allowed. I'm from Puerto Rico. <laughs> yeah, that is true. It's a trade off here. The air conditioning is so loud. <laughs> it's what, <laughs> which poison do I choose? Yeah, that's right. That's right. So, we, uh, yes, sir. How, how do we do this? I mean, I'm a little bit um, jumping into the last minute here. Well, as long as you are here, there's a talk, and uh, meaning the set of slides, I think we're good to go. So one, I think, simply goes ahead. Uh, I will do a brief introduction in three minutes. Uh, I think we've sort of settled on five past as a good starting time. This is empirical, not uh, fundamental. So uh, you'll have to go with that. So okay. at 305, we'll start. If you share your screen and then take it away, and then we'll have a, a question and answer session, which we'll, we will moderate. And are you OK with recording the uh, uh, presentation so we can put it on a website later or what have you? Yeah, sure. Um, if there are thoughts about that, we'll record it and we can talk afterwards as to, uh, you know, wh when and if, if to distribute it. Okay, sure. Sounds yeah, good. Because it's, it's a nuanced question. So by the way, we'll sort of record it, but not post it until we talk afterwards. Sounds good. Very good. We are at 35. Okay, it's rapidly rising. Two minutes past. Great. By the way, so I just, this is, um, is this University of Berkeley or Lawrence Berkeley Lab? I think it's. Lawrence Berkeley Lab Colloquium, is that right? Yes, this is, it's the Lab AQT Colloquium, although our audience is very broad. And in fact, it's getting even broader in the electronic domain, but it's mostly within the Berkeley ecosystem for sure. Okay. We have with us Rick Muller, who is an official Berkeley uh, member at the moment. Uh, let me know when you want me to share a screen or any of that. One minute, 47 seconds. Got it. Oh, that's right. I remember from my last talk at Berkeley, this is Berkeley time, right? You've got... Uh... Uh, Berkeley time is evolving. Yes. <laughs> Real Berkeley time is 10 minutes past. I, I don't think any meeting has started 10 minutes past, given Zoom, but there is a little bit of a uh, natural build-in to go from meeting to meeting. <laughs> Our ALD may mean that something different. Uh, in terms of specific timings for the CS department, I hope five minutes is a is a suitable compromise. It's it's totally fine with me. Okay, very good. We have been blessed by the Department of Energy. You heard it here first, folks. <laughs> nice. Today's been a crazy day. This is. Uh, past five hours, it's been four hours of video calls. Yes, this is a common for most of my days. I'm just very proud that I gave myself a haircut and I still have hair with an iPhone and a trimmer. Wow. Yeah, I need a, I need a haircut. When I guys. cut my hair, it was with no iPhone and a trimmer. This is the difference, David, between a theorist and an experimentalist. <laughs> In the end, you decided on the equality measure with all your hairs being of equal length and a short length. All right, very good. I think we are five past. So uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our AQT colloquium speaker for today, uh, Professor Joseph Emerson. A few words about our speaker. He is the Chief Executive Officer and Chief Scientist at Quantum Benchmark Incorporated and Professor of Applied Physics at the Institute of Quantum Computing at the University of Waterloo in Canada. Uh, Professor Emerson is a leading researcher in quantum computing. He pioneered the now industry standard randomized benchmarking method for assessing quantum gate errors and his more, more recent work on randomized compiling and cycle error reconstruction enables robust and scalable methods to improve the large scale performance of quantum computing. So please join me in welcoming Professor Emerson today to deliver his presentation entitled Cycle Error Reconstruction and Randomized Compiling to Extend the Computing Power of Noisy Quantum Hardware. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Irfan. And thank you to your team for the invitation to speak and for the opportunity to collaborate, which I'll be able to touch upon in the talk. This is actually uh, very much an ideal audience for um, the research we've been doing and the uh, R&D effort we've been doing to uh, turn some of our theoretical ideas into practical tools and then of course test them
on hardware because you know the lesson I learned uh, early on in my career is that um, as a theorist, no experimentalist trusts you until you you show that it works in the lab. Uh, so um, yeah, this re work is sponsored uh, mostly by uh, Quantum Benchmark and the Army Research Office, which has given us um, an STTR grant to do some of the software development and all of the uh, results I'll show to you today were generated using that software tool. So uh, I'll start with something light and fun, which some of you might have already seen, uh, which is this kind of playful way of expressing the challenge we have ahead, which is to put an analogy uh, between uh, navigating icebergs and, and uh, navigating the challenges of quantum computing. So we're, we're trying to get past this iceberg and it's easy to see these simple gate error rates uh, via tools that are now standard like randomized benchmarking and gate set tomography, as well as the very old school methods like Ramsey experiments and so on. But the challenge is that we have a much deeper uh, set of uh, error syndromes that can impact performance. And uh, what we're focused on uh, in collaboration with experimental teams like uh, the AQT project is to uh, find ways to determine really the full impact of errors on the performance of quantum computing so that we can reach quantum advantage. And this is relevant not just for the NISC era, but also in the eventual fault tolerant uh, uh, approach. And so our tools, uh, and really it's been gratifying as a theorist to do this process of working through a startup because it's been massively enabling to get some more abstract theoretical ideas into the hands of experimentalists who can directly test them out and tell us what works, tell us what's not working. And I'll show you a bit about that today. And one of the key messages that we've learned and which experimentalists know now that they've scaled up to multiple qubit systems is that the error profile this kind of, this, uh, what's the word? This, um, not topology, but this, uh, um, the phenotype of the errors, what's, what's happening underneath the surface with each iceberg is very distinct. And similarly with, with control, the errors you see depend very sensitively on the control that's being applied. I think we had this older paradigm of decoherence as environmental errors and this hope or this naive thought that those environmental errors would be kind of a, a, a control independent process. But it turns out that the dominant error mechanisms are really driven by the control fields. And the control fields, of course, depend on what you're trying to do. And so what we're seeing now is that really the characterization problem is a characterization of the distinct control mechanisms that are being applied to do different combinations of gates. And I'll show you very strong evidence for that. The other thing to convince you of is that as we move beyond the qubit to multi-qubit systems, we of course hope to harness the power of the exponential um, uh, size of Hilbert space. Uh, and uh, the challenge is that uh, while we get this two to the n growth in exponential power, uh, this exponential growth of power of quantum computing, the error problem the number of error parameters tied to every distinct clock cycle, every distinct sequence of parallel gates, it grows even faster. So if you assume, a, you make a very strong assumption that you have only Markovian errors, then you have two to the four n uh, different potential error processes or error pathways, um, independent parameters required to describe the errors on an n qubit processor. And so you can all do the math in your heads, a 50 qubit chip, uh, which is state of the art today, you have a two to the 50 dimensional Hilbert space, which is very big, a very big number, very powerful quantum computer. Uh, the number of error parameters in principle that you can confront is uh, two to the 200, you know, which is approaching the number of atoms in the galaxy. So this is a massive problem, finding efficient ways to hone in on the leading errors is a major challenge for our field. And that's uh, what we're developing tools to address. And I'll tell you about today. And of course it goes without saying, but please don't hesitate to ask any questions if people have a way to chime in through chat. Uh, 
or um, through, you know, directly, you know, speaking over me, please go ahead. So uh, the way I've been giving this talk lately is to focus on experimental results first, show lots of pretty pictures, but I decided today to try something different. I'm going to go through the theory first, and I hope this works. You can tell me afterwards if you thought it worked or not. Um, but uh, just to give you some of the theoretical framework for this, uh, so we have um, a general error process, and I'm going to um, unfortunately interchange between a capital lambda and a scripted capital E, math cal E in latex notation to mean error channel. Uh, so here I'm using uh, capital uh, lambda, and, and the idea is that we can express any error channel that's Markovian in terms of what's called a chi matrix, where we look at all of the different um, uh, uh, poly basis errors that could occur, and we write down a matrix of coefficients for that. The key piece to realize is that in this Markovian limit, a general error process has mismatched um, indices. Irfan, can you see when I move my, uh, my mouse so as I indicate the pieces of the slide? Yes, I can see your mouse moving over the uh, indices there. Great. So alpha and beta are distinct indices, and we have these, this is this 2 to the n by 2 to the n dimensional matrix. Now, a very special case is of what's called a poly error channel. And that's when we, we don't get the mismatch indices. We only have the diagonal terms. Uh, and, um, and so that's this enforced by this delta function constraint. And in this limit, we have a simplified error model, which is a probability of different poly errors. And uh, so what I mean by poly errors, if you have an n qubit system, uh, you know, the first term would be all identities, which basically means no error. So that's the ideal world. Uh, the second term in this sum is just an X error on the last qubit, then a Y error on the last qubit, and so on until we have a tensor product of Z errors on all qubits. And then we've listed all possible error terms in this way. And it turns out one of the key messages of this talk, theoretically and experimentally, is about managing the fact that coherent errors produce these off diagonal terms in this first equation. So what do I mean by coherent error? What I mean by a coherent error, examples of that would be things like a miscalibration where you're trying to do say a unitary transformation or just say a pi pulse or a pi on two pulse about one or several qubits. And instead of doing that perfect pi on two pulse, you do pi on two plus epsilon or pi on two minus epsilon. So some small calibration, miscalibration of the system where epsilon will vary from qubit to qubit. It will depend on which gate you're trying to do. And this applies also to two qubit gates. You're trying to do a C naught, but instead you do a small um, miscalibration of those parameters. And so calibration errors like that, which I call coherent errors, are um, lead to off diagonal terms. Uh, when, you, when you do not have coherent errors or calibration errors, you can hope to achieve this diagonal form. And, uh, and that's gonna be an ongoing message throughout the talk. So I've shown you already what I call the poly Krauss model, or it's called a stochastic uh, error channel or a poly error channel. It's not something that's physically natural. In fact, one of the insights that I've achieved in the last five or 10 years of collaborating with experimentalists is that um, a T2 process, which is usually a performance limiting process uh, for single qubits, um, now the system design and, and device fabrication and control has reached a level where uh, the T2 process is not the limiting performance limiting error. So a T2 process is a poly error channel. Um, it turns out that the control errors, miscalibration errors are often the dominant, the dominant error source. Uh, so everything we've learned about decoherence and coupling to an environment and so on is often no longer the leading uh, performance limiting error process. It's just getting the calibration right uh, and removing in particular, not just calibration of the pulse control on the systems you're trying to drive, but the other systems which you're driving off resonantly. And so one of the tools that uh, Joel Wallman and I developed a few years ago, which builds on older ideas from dynamical decoupling and so on, and, and then ideas from Manny Nil on poly frame randomization is a tool which we call randomized compiling. 
And so what randomized compiling is designed to do, it's just designed to be an almost um, cost-free method of converting these natural errors, which are control errors, into uh, stochastic errors. And, uh, and the idea is randomized compiling does that at every clock cycle or every layer or every moment in the, uh, in the, in the quantum register, every moment in time. And so when, and I'll tell you, tell you a lot more about this today, about how randomized compiling uh, helps achieve that and the conditions under which it achieves that, which has been actually a very, um, the experimental collaboration with uh, IRFAN's team has been very insightful for us in terms of understanding limiting cases where randomized compiling does and does not work well. Um, so just to talk about the mathematics a bit more, your error channel in this poly, uh, poly Krauss form, it's now a two to the two n dimensional probability vector. And just to remind the reader, uh, the, not the reader, the audience, uh, a depolarizing error channel loved by theorists is um, a very, very special case of this general poly error channel. In fact, a depolarizing error channel is one where all of these probabilities are the same, except for on the identity term. And so there's basically, it's, instead of having two to the four n parameter, two to, excuse me, two to the two n parameters, you have only one parameter describing this uh, complex error process. So it's a very idealistic limit of this uh, stochastic error channel. And so now a little bit more math, which some of you may be unfamiliar with, but is very valuable to learn, is that um, when we have a, uh, any error channel, in this non markov in this excuse me, in this Markovian limit, we can talk about, of course, what it's doing is it's taking some input state rho, which is, and this is mathematical overkill, I'm calling it a bounded operator for finite dimensions, they're all bounded. Uh, so really it's just taking a density operator to a density operator, say input state rho to an output state sigma. The key idea for what I think is the most natural and insightful mathematical representation of this error process is to expand the dense input density operator across a basis of, of operators. So what I'm gonna use throughout is the poly basis. So you all know the block sphere and how a pure state is on the surface of the block sphere and a mixed state or a general state is somewhere in the interior of that block sphere. And we know we can completely specify that density operator on the block sphere uh, by three parameters. So rho is identity over two plus uh, some coefficients in front of x, y, and z, the poly operators. Those coefficients are often rx, ry, and rz, and if that's the vector that tells you where you are in the block sphere. That concept generalizes to n qubit systems, where we have then two to the n coefficients, b alpha, instead of just three coefficients specify, specifying what the state is in this generalized block sphere for an n-dimensional system. But the key mathematical idea is we're just expressing the state in terms of its coefficients with respect to this basis of poly operators. And you calculate these coefficients just by taking the trace of the density operator against each of the basis operators, which are poly operators, which is just actually the expectation value of that poly operator viewed as an observable. And here the dagger went away because poly operators for qubits are, are Hermitian and self-adjoint, so the dagger doesn't do anything, um, which makes it a, an observable. And now once you understand that, then you realize that the error process itself can be represented as a matrix acting on this vector of coefficients. So now think about the set of coefficients B alpha as a vector, and then we can think about the, the process lambda as a matrix that acts on that vector. And we can construct these matrix elements in this way, we take as input to the error channel some poly operator, and then we compute its, its this is actually an inner product, this uh, trace of, the, of another poly operator against the output state or the output operator achieved by acting on the input operator with the error channel. And so that way we construct these uh, matrix elements indexed by alpha and beta, and then we have this matrix representation written here as an equation which is the alpha th component of the output state is just a sum over the column, uh, over the, uh, um, over all rows of the alpha th column of this matrix multiplied by the coefficients of the input state. 
So what we see now is something which is incredibly simple, which is that any Markovian error channel can be understood completely in terms of linear algebra. And we have a matrix, and so we can think about it in terms of all the tools, all of the tools of linear algebra available to us, diagonalization, eigenvalues, and so on. Um, most importantly, it's composable. So if we have an error process associated with some um, time interval, um, zero to T1, and then we have an error process associated with the time interval T1 to T2, then the error process associated with the full time scale zero to T2 is just the product of the matrices. So it has all of these very natural um, properties we're used to thinking of in terms of unitary operators are now extended to understanding error processes. And uh, when we choose the basis to be the poly basis, this Liouville representation is called the poly transfer matrix. Um, so what we're gonna look, use are tools to estimate the eigenvalues of this error process. Now it turns out that when the error process is a poly channel, meaning we don't have calibration errors because we've applied randomized compiling, then the full information of the diagonal elements, the diagonal elements are the eigenvalues and they contain full information about the error process. It's still an exponentially large set as you can see here, uh, but it has very nice properties. So in particular, um, VEC P alpha is when we write some poly operator as a vector, um, uh, as a column vector. And then in particular, this error process acting on a poly input state um, is now the poly input state is an eigenstate of that error process. And when we act on it with this matrix, we just get the eigenvalue associated with that poly input state. And then the relationship between these eigenvalues lambda and the probabilities p alpha in this Krauss picture where the Krauss operators are poly operators with no off diagonal terms is determined by this simple formula. So you sum over all probabilities uh, where the poly of interest commutes with the other polys and you subtract out the sum of the probabilities where the poly operators anti-commute with the polys of interest. And in this way, you have an invertible map between the probabilities in the poly Krauss picture, which have a nice physical interpretation, and the eigenvalues of the error map, which have a very nice mathematical interpretation. So we have this one-to-one -one correspondence. Now, let me make this a concrete example. So this is something I've added for this talk, which I've been thinking about and telling people with hand-waving gestures for a while, and I thought, hey, I should just make a slide about this. So think about an error model that's a calibration error where we're over-rotating about the z-axis by some angle theta. So here we're imagining theta is small. Maybe it's one degree or two degrees. So theta is not the intended target transformation, but the error on that target transformation. So you're familiar with the unitary expressed as the exponentiation of the z-poly operator, and then we can write that as a two by two matrix um, in the usual way. Now, if we express that as a super operator, then you get this very nice matrix where the first thing that's nice about it is that the angle that appears is the physical rotation angle, not the block sphere rotation angle. Um, and then the one here in the upper left is just the fact that we have a nice trace preserving process and the zeros along the upper row and the leftmost column reflect the fact that we have a unital process. So we're taking identity to identity and we're not losing information to higher dimensional spaces. So it's a very simple model, obviously of an error. And then the point is that we just recover this lower triangle, this lower block matrix here, this three by three matrix. And this is the magical thing about this picture is that this three by three matrix is just the O3 rotation on the polarization vector of the qubit. So the physical polarization of the qubit is being rotated by the usual classical rotation. And then the most important piece of the story when we see this example is to realize that when we're gonna run this error process through randomized compiling, it's gonna truncate these off diagonal terms and set them to zero. And why is that important? That's important because Think about theta being small, we tailor expand these terms in the matrix. If we tailor expand sine theta, we're gonna get the first order term of order theta. If we tailor expand cos theta, the first order error correction is of order theta squared. 
So this means that, excuse me, this means that um, if you can get rid of the off diagonal terms, that means you can get rid of the leading contribution of the error and only see the second leading term, which is theta squared. And one of the remarkable things I'll come back to in this talk is that when you do a randomized benchmarking experiment and a lot of other simple characterization methods, you're just seeing the cos theta projection of the error. You're just seeing, you're sensitive to the diagonal terms, which means that uh, a stochastic error process and a calibration error process will look the same when you're just looking at a fidelity. But when you look at a norm-based measure of error, which includes making sure that your final probability distribution for a circuit is the right probability distribution, then in that case, you're gonna pick up on these off diagonal terms in the error. And these off diagonal terms will actually give a much more dramatic error. So if you measure your randomized benchmarking on your qubits and you get 10 to the minus four error rates, that's telling you that one minus theta squared is 10 to the minus four. But of course, then when it comes to running an algorithm and saying, what's my, how close is my probability distribution to the correct probability distribution, then the sine theta error terms will come in, which means that the errors will come in at the 10 to the minus two scale, which is the square root of this theta squared. And so now all of a sudden the impact of that error will be 10 to the minus two on the probability distribution, which is usually the physics of what you're trying to measure for your application. And of course that's bad news because you were hoping you have 10 to the minus four errors but if it's a calibration error and you don't know that, that can impact you at the 10 to the minus two level in application performance. And so much of the story I'll tell you today is about identifying these errors, overcoming them and suppressing them. And that'll be a theme throughout the talk. Let me pause here if there are any questions about the math. Have a sip of my coffee while you all think. Um, Okay, I don't hear any shouts, so maybe I'll move ahead. So figures of merit. So now I'm gonna take a deeper dive on what I just told you. So uh, the average gate fidelity is a very standard way to measure error. How that works is you uh, look at the error process by injecting some input state, usually a pure state. Uh, in fact, in this metric, always a pure state. And then you see how close do I return to that input state under that error process. And then you average over all possible input states. And then when you talk about the infidelity, you're just, it's just a trivial one minus that average gate fidelity. And the infidelity here is exactly what randomized benchmarking measures. And the key point, as I mentioned earlier, is that if you calculate this for some er error map, it's only sensitive to the diagonal terms. So it's only picking up these terms of order theta squared and it's not seeing these terms of order theta, which are much stronger errors. And then uh, to see these terms, these off diagonal terms, these order theta terms, you have to look at either a diamond norm or a total variational distance, uh, or, which is called the L1 norm. And I'll get to that in a second. So the diamond norm is the most commonly used metric in fault tolerance. Um, and it's computed, I, I don't think I take a deep dive on defining it here, uh, but just to state what it is and give a notation for it. And let me just clarify one common misconception about the diamond norm. The diamond norm is defined by looking at, instead of like in the fidelity where you average over all states, in the diamond norm, you take the supremum over all input states. And so the diamond norm has this reputation as being uh, something that looks at your worst case input state. And I've heard many times over the past 20 years, people say, oh, well, the diamond norm, it's great for theorists to get comfort that they're looking at the worst case error so they can prove things. But in practice, how relevant is it? Because when I look at a complex process on a you know, 10 or 20 or 100 qubit system, there's an exponentially large Hilbert space. The chances that I'm going to come across the worst case state in my computation is exponentially small and totally negligible. So I don't even care about the diamond norm it's completely unrealistic overestimate of the error. But the important message here is that, and Joel Waldman has a nice paper about this, that you can define a diamond norm by taking the average overall states instead of the supremum overall states. And in that case, all of the properties of the diamond norm I tell you about today also apply in that average case. So the really the key point is that um, 
it's a norm-based measure of error. And uh, the worst case thing is kind of a, is kind of a bad uh, misnomer for the diamond norm. Uh, the other common metric of error that's norm-based is um, this one norm, which is basically saying, look, let Q be the ideal, Q of I here, let that be the ideal probability distribution I would get in the textbook if I had no errors in the experiment. And let P of I be the actual noise-induced experimental probability distribution. And then you want to say, well, how close is my noisy output distribution? And here I is indexing over the computational basis. How close is my noisy probability distribution to the true one? And that's ultimately a measure of how successful was I in getting some information out about this algorithm I'm running. And then what you do is you just take the absolute value of the differences and sum over every bin in your probability distribution. So this sum would typically have two to the n terms in it. And so obviously you can't measure it exhaustively if you have a large number of qubits. Uh, but we can still talk about its properties in the abstract and we can bound its properties using clever tools. Uh, so, right, so these are two norm-based measures of error. And then uh, on my next slide, I'm gonna tell you about how, uh, what I hinted at earlier, that these norm-based measures of error are going to pick up on these off-diagonal terms. And that's the real challenge we're facing now in getting the errors to be manageable. So, um, so the first point is that the, the this very practical experimental quantity uh, for NISC applications um, is actually upper bounded by the diamond norm, which is this kind of fault tolerance norm. And, um, and, and this upper bound is in fact um, close to saturated in practical instances. And the point is that these norms are very sensitive to control calibration errors. I've said that a few times, and here this is making it concrete. So when you do a randomized benchmarking experiment, you measure the infidelity of that error process. In fact, with randomized benchmarking, you're getting not just the error process of some gate or of some cycle, but averaged over a set of gates. So that's a weakness of randomized benchmarking, which we overcome with some of these tools I'll tell you about today. Uh, but I'm jumping ahead. The point is that if your error map is stochastic, so if you have a poly error channel, either because you're lucky and your physical error model is a stochastic channel, or because you use randomized compiling and forced the error channel to be a stochastic error map, then this lower bound is saturated. So what that means is the diamond norm, which of course upper bounds the output probability distribution errors, is saturated at this lower bound, which basically means that the infidelity number you measure by a randomized benchmarking is exactly the precision with which you're measuring the probability distribution. And that's only if you have a stochastic error model. If you have a calibration error model that's dominating your performance, uh, then you saturate the upper bound. And then the randomized benchmarking number comes in, you get this quadratic hit. And of course, the quadratic hit sounds kind of mild until you realize what the orders of magnitude are. And so, as I mentioned earlier, if you know that your randomized benchmarking number is 10 to the minus four, but your full contribution to that is from calibration errors, whether it be calibration on the gate itself or crosstalk, coherent crosstalk on other qubits, then you have to use the square root, the, 10 to the square root of 10 to the minus four is 10 to the minus two. So this quadratic effect is actually a two order of magnitude effect at current experimental capabilities. In addition to that square root, I'm not even mentioning the dimensionality hit you get uh, due to multi-body coherences, which can be in or, you know, order two, four, or much bigger, blowing up this upper bound. So the, the full story now is, is that if you have these calibration errors, these off diag elements hurt you, and this is how much they hurt you. And so a lot of what I'll tell you about today is about suppressing those off diagonal terms and then characterizing the residual terms on the diagonal to inform uh, pulse design and NISC application co-design. Um, so here I'm just giving kind of an overview of this coherent error problem. Many of these bullet points I've mentioned already, uh, but the, the big story here is that coherent errors severely limit overall algorithm performance. Um, in particular, also when we look ahead to fault tolerance, many fault tolerant thresholds that get us excited like 10 to the minus two error rates, uh, 
um, or 10 to the minus two error rates are- Joe, if I remember co correctly, the square root dependence is important. Yeah, sure. What do you mean though? What, well, coherent errors go like square root, go like, like they, they go slower than non-coherent errors. Um, like for so example, in randomized benchmarking, coherent errors appear quadratically while, while relaxation and defacing does not appear quadratically, appear linearly. Yeah, that, that's the square root I mean here. Yeah. And that's actually maybe related to what you're getting, jumping ahead to, which is this possibility that coherent errors can accumulate in an adversarial way. Ah, uh, yes, yes. So okay. sorry for jumping ahead. No, that, that's fine, that's fine. But that's actually an important piece. Let me mention it here anyways, because it's more interesting than these bullet points, which is that, um, you know, a common conception is that coherent errors can be a problem because if you're unlucky and they can, they can combine adversarially, you can get a quadratic growth with circuit depth of the errors. And that's certainly true, but most people think it's, it's unlikely that that happens in practice. So here I'm imagining uh, a circuit where I have M steps in time. And then the idea is that the error can grow as M squared, uh, whereas you get ballistic growth, which is order linear in M for stochastic errors. And that's an additional problem in addition to the square root. So when you get this quadratic growth in time due to this adversarial effect, it's actually M squared times the square root of R. Um, I tend to not emphasize that quadratic growth story so much because people tend to think it's not really a problem in practice because it's a, not, it's a rare occurrence. Um, and so I emphasize the square root effect because it's, it's, it's not rare, it's, it's every time that it'll happen. And so both hurt you, but this one hurts you all the time. The M squared is kind of an unlucky uh, pain point. Did that help, David? Yes, thank you. Okay, sure, thanks for, thanks for bringing that up because that's an important distinction and that might have uh, thrown people off. Um, so uh, the reasons why you want to get rid of calibration errors, other than we don't want to get, we, of course we want to get rid of all errors. So we want to improve you know, the fabrication process. We want better substrates so we don't have two level fluctuators. But the story I'm trying to emphasize is why we want to prioritize calibration errors. Um, of course, for ion trap systems, calibration errors are almost their dominant error, their only error source. But for super and qubit systems, you get an interplay of both. And so my pitch here is that calibration errors are, are the, the biggest problem to deal with. Um, so they limit algorithm performance in the ways I mentioned. The fault tolerant thresholds we want to reach are assuming the errors are stochastic. In fact, they're assuming the errors are depolarizing. So these, those thresholds don't apply if your error model is coherent. Uh, or at least the proofs don't go through. Uh, they might still apply if we're lucky. Um, the other piece is, um, let me just jump ahead to in vitro versus in vivo. Um, if you're doing randomized benchmarking and measuring error rates, and it turns out they're calibration errors, then you're really only seeing this cos theta manifestation of them. And then when you run an application, you're seeing the sine theta manifestation. And so the idea of randomized compiling is to close the gap between what you're learning through your diagnostics and the errors that are actually impacting your performance. So the idea is, you know, randomized benchmarking and other randomization tools for error characterization are killing off the off diagonal terms. So why not kill off those terms also in vivo when we're running an algorithm so that we have a, we are closing the gap between what we're seeing via our error characterization tools and what we're seeing when we're running algorithms. Okay, so now, I made you guys sit through, for those of you who are experimentalists, sit through this painful mathematical background, um, which I hope was helpful. Uh, but now you get to see data and beautiful figures. Uh, thanks to all the experimentalists we've collaborated with, what I'll, which I'll mention throughout. Um, and the first one I'll start out with is how we now diagnose these poly, uh, these, uh, these poly channel probabilities, these poly error probabilities. And so uh, one of the key tools is uh, something called cycle benchmarking, which we use for cycle error reconstruction. And the idea is it's, a, it's kind of a randomized benchmarking experiment on steroids. So randomized benchmarking has several problems. Uh, the thing that you're randomizing are these Clifford operations. The random, randomization comes from Clifford operations, which for a single qubit, it's easy. They're just single qubit gates. 
for two qubits, a random Clifford is already, each operation is requiring two or three C naughts. So people usually are cavalier saying gate when they mean operation, and the operation is actually a whole bunch of gates. It's two or three C naughts and, and, a, and a half dozen single qubit gates to do one randomizing Clifford operation in a two qubit randomized benchmarking experiment. So already now, if you're trying to characterize the error on a C naught, the, the probe you're using to measure that is some big random Clifford, which is dominating your error, and that's not good. So you want the, the, the randomizing gates to be, have a very small error footprint compared to the gate sequence you're trying to measure the errors on. And so what cycle benchmarking does, it says, let's take some gate combination we want to characterize. This might be some parallel set of C phases or some parallel set of C naughts across a large qubit register. And we want to understand the errors on that. So let's, let's use as little overhead as possible to learn that. And so the trick we've adopted is to randomize just with poly operations. So these R's here are just um, identity X, Y, and Z poly rotations on the individual qubits. And so now tip, in typical experimental setups, you'll have kind of a big error impact from doing this complex parallel entangling gate sequence and a smaller error impact from doing these single qubit rotations. And what then we measure is the aggregate error in this gray block. So we call this a dressed gate. So this is the bare gate. And when you add the single qubit polys, you get a dressed gate. And we're characterizing the error on the dressed gate. And then we repeat that m times in time to create an, a depth m quantum circuit. And what that does is that gives us that amplification of error that leads to this decay of fidelities. And then a lot of the cleverness here goes into ways to inject input states into this process so that we can cleanly measure isolated exponential decays that are exactly the eigenvalues of that um, Liouville matrix. So I showed you that Liouville matrix with all those eigenvalues, lambda one through lambda d squared. And so the trick is to measure those eigenvalues. And so, and so the cleverness here in these green boxes is about uh, isolating individual eigenvalues and estimating them precisely, and then sampling from those eigenvalues in a clever way. And so that's kind of the nuts and bolts of what a, a cycle benchmarking protocol looks like. And that's the backbone of all of the error reconstruction routines I'll tell you about today. Pausing for questions and to catch my breath, have a sip of coffee. So let me first show you um, some experiments we did on IBM Q. Holy cow, we're running, okay. Uh, I'll try to go a bit more quicker. So what we do is we take a five qubit chip, we're gonna do a C naught on qubit zero one, and we're gonna reconstruct these poly errors. And so let me skip over the details of the complexity of this error map, except to say that this is a clever way of plotting these poly error probabilities. Um, and uh, when you do the C naught on qubit zero one, and you, when you do randomized benchmarking, what you're seeing are the errors in this column, which is the column associated with qubit zero one and all the different poly error processes that can occur on that. And what we see uh, over in the rest of the figure are the errors occurring either independently or in a correlated way with the other idle qubits. And this is a heat map, so errors in the yellow regime are 15% probability of error for that poly error process. And in the dark blue, it's around the 1% error range. And so what, you, what jumps out at you right away is that when you do randomized benchmarking, you're only seeing these errors and you're getting the kind of 2% or nine error rate or 98% fidelity that IBM reports on their webpage as their C0 quality. And the important piece here is that the dominant errors are not on qubit zero one. They're actually due to off resonant driving and other physics on the idle qubits. And what you see here is uh, crosstalk and correlated errors around the rest of the chip, which are not seen when you do randomized benchmarking. And so if you're tuning up using randomized benchmarking, then um, you're, you're not sensitive to the leading errors. 
And, um, and in particular, what you have is that the contribution of these off gate errors, these crosstalk errors, is 10 times bigger than the contribution of the gate errors on the qubits in the gate itself. Um, and so that's a dramatic story that we need better tools to holistically and globally uh, assess how well our pulse design is working. And that's one of the things we're working on with um, Irfan's team. Um, so the harsh way of saying this is that if you're doing randomized benchmarking, you know basically nothing. Um, as one of the people that pioneered randomized benchmarking, I feel like I'm allowed to beat up on it, especially now that we have better tools like cycle benchmarking. Um, so by learning about these errors, you learn about, notice that there's a heavy phase shift error on qubit two, which is manifesting in, this is kind of a redundant signature of that. Um, and what we're learning here is that it's not a correlated error, but it's really an independent phase shift error on qubit two. The good news is that's the kind of thing you can correct just with a virtual, with a virtual Z gate. So not only is this a dominant error, which is bad news, the good news is it's easy to fix with, in a, basically without messing with the rest of your calibration. Here's some data we did with Innsbruck, which I will just skip uh, because in the view of time, I'd rather focus on newer data. Um, and here's one such set of newer data. Here what we do, and this is the key story. Um, if you've seen these recent papers by Steve Fumia, uh, you'll realize by looking at this figure what's missing in what Steve Fumia is proposing. So here we take the Urense chip, which is a five qubit chip, on the IBM uh, public platform. And we look at every possible combination of two qubit gates you can do on that chip. So you can do uh, in the first column, these two sets of CNOT gates in parallel. You can do these two, not, two sets of gates of CNOTs in parallel. And then their architecture doesn't allow any other parallel CNOTs, but you can do isolated CNOTs in these different, on these different pairs. And then what we do is we reconstruct the leading errors on each of these control sequences. And the key part of this, there's two key stories here. One story is that notice how the error profile is completely different on each different clock cycle. So whether you're, which combination of CNOT gates you're doing gives a completely different error story. So that's the first message because uh, the techniques that Steve Fomia has been promoting recently average the errors over all of these control sequences. And so what's, what's key about cycle benchmarking is we're able to isolate the error profile on each distinct clock cycle. And so that's absolutely critical because they're totally different. So randomized benchmarking and the channel learning that uh, Fumia talks about is averaging over groups of operations, which include all of these gates, and therefore kind of smear the error information out across these different distinct uh, uh, pathways. The second piece of this story is the story I already mentioned on the previous figure, but a very dramatic illustration of it. If you're trying to do application co-design or some kind of clever compiling to minimize the use of CNOT gates that are bad um, to achieve better NISC performance, then you would go to IBM's website and say, oh, based on randomized benchmarking, this is my best CNOT gate. So I should prefer decompositions which use this CNOT gate over the others because I'm paying a very small error price. But when you do the cycle error reconstruction, what you find is that their best C0 gate is actually their worst C0 gate because the crosstalk errors are the worst. So it's not just a slight shift in perspective, but a complete inversion of what is actually your best strategy for compilation. And that is, an, I mean, here we just got lucky. Not every chip with IBM you know, some, the ordering changes on every chip, but on this chip, the ordering changes, the best becomes the worst and vice versa. So that pretty dramatically illustrates the importance of these globally aware error characterization tools for tune-up and calibration and co-design. Um, great. Um, I'll, I think I'll skip error adaptive compiling, uh, but basically this is showing how we can correct these Z phase errors by just putting the corrective uh, single qubit Z gate, which is often a virtual gate, into the next clock cycle and undo it. And in particular, and this is kind of a, a crazy thing, the Z errors on this clock cycle without error adaptive compiling, just the native Z errors, correspond to a 30 degree 
Z rotation. That's how severe the crosstalk is for some of these cross resonance architectures. And that we can undo it. We reduce the air impact from 40% to 10%. The residual 10% is probably due to the fact that there's some fast fluctuation happening that we can't undo through the crude control knobs we have access to on IBM. But working with uh, the team in Berkeley, we're excited about having access to a deeper layer of control to get even better performance here. And these are the before after plots for the heat maps with and without this air adaptive compiling step. Sorry, that was so fast. I hope the message was clear. Um, now I get to tell you about randomized compiling and the active, uh, the current active uh, effort we're, we're doing with uh, the team at, at, through, the, uh, through the AQT project. So randomized compiling is this idea, how do we convert calibration errors to stochastic errors so that we're not seeing the square root effect, but just the pure uh, unsquare rooted or quadratically better um, impact of the error at this you know, 10 to the minus four level. So the idea is you insert virtual random gates and then uh, you don't actually execute them, but just absorb them into the single qubit gate round so that you're not changing the circuit depth. You're just changing the single qubit gates in each circuit. And then you run this randomization multiple times and you get a family of circuits with the same hard gate or C0 gate structure, but different single qubit gates. And then we can track all of this and add up results. It's all scalable. And so then we can in that way average over. And, and when I showed you the road to the sine theta term in the off diagonal, it's really just a generalization of this idea that if I can change theta to minus theta, then I can average over sine theta and minus sine theta terms because sine is an odd function. And that's exactly what's happening here. It's no more complex than that. It's just, there's a bit more uh, bookkeeping. And so let's look at this on the current chip um, at the Lawrence Berkeley effort for some experimental verification of this. Let me skip through all these talking points and just mention them verbally. And so we're using four qubits, uh, four transmon qubits in this eight qubit architecture. And um, these are cross resonance gates. Uh, and so we're mitigating uh, the crosstalk that, that occurs on these. Um, we're exploring error characterization of paralyzed gate sets to improve pulse design, both through randomized benchmarking, uh, this XRB protocol for estimating the degree of coherent error, which I don't have time to talk about today, and also how we can suppress the residual coherent errors through randomization and randomized compiling for random circuits. And that's what I'll show you um, here. So here is uh, we're looking at some random circuits on uh, the AQT hardware. And here we're looking at increasing the cycle depth along the X axis. And then the Y axis is recording, what is the, you know, when you run each circuit, you measure an output string and on four qubits, you have two to the four bit strings. And then the question is, what's the probability that you got the wrong bit string out uh, when you ran that experiment? This is basically what the total variational distance is measuring is, did I get the right probability distribution? If I didn't get the right probability distribution, it's because some bit strings were being reported incorrectly due to errors. And so here we show uh, bare means running the random circuit uh, without randomized compiling. And you see, um, you know, with the total variational distance, a large number is bad. So basically, you know, 0.2 is around 20% probability of getting the wrong bit string out. And you see that as you increase the circuit depth, the probability of getting the wrong bit string increases. And when you're around 50%, you're basically getting into the noise. There's very little signal left. And what you see when you run the same circuits through randomized compiling is a reduction in the error probability uh, in the total variational, total variational distance. And you still get a growth of error with depth, but it's a much more modest growth. And these are violin plots which show a distribution over different uh, families of random circuits. Um, and this is just for uh, running uh, single qubit gates on, um, on the chip. And I believe I have more data here where we explore, one of the questions we often get is, well, look, if you're looking at all possible poly randomizations, that's you know four different polys at each location on the circuit. If you have n qubits of depth m, you're looking at an exponentially large set of randomizations, which obviously we can't do in practice. But the amazing thing about randomized compiling is it inherits the beauty and magic of random sampling which is that we only need to explore some very, very small, exponentially small subset 
of all of these different you know, random twirls to get the benefits. And so here, what we're looking at is again, um, different, uh, here different circuit depths, but now looking how many randomizations of the circuit do we need? And this is an important experimental constraint because the FPGA only has so much memory and you have to load circuits in the memory. And so if you're changing the random circuits, you're, that there's a cost to reloading the FPGA with new circuits. And so here what this is showing at the various depths, and this is consistent with what, we, what we've seen numerically, is that around 10 randomizations, 10 random samplings from this exponentially large number of polyrandomizations are enough to get you the majority benefit of the gains of randomized compiling. So just a few randomizations give you some gain, 10 randomizations give you most of the gain, and after about 20 randomizations, you're getting almost the full gain of attenuating these off diagonals to kill off that square root of R effect for your calibration errors. And just reminding the audience that um, crosstalk errors are often coherent, like calibration errors, and so they benefit from this. And, um, and you see here that the gain is going from about a, about a, a doubling in the performance of the circuit basically reducing by a factor of two the probability of getting the wrong bit string out under some computation of interest. And so we're very excited about this experimental validation. I'm just showing you a subset of the data that the team has generated, and you can look forward to seeing uh, applications with uh, practical, um, with kind of standard, uh, what's the right way to say it, um, uh, uh, standard subroutines for applications where we've explored this benefit and that will appear in a paper soon. Uh, here's some old randomized compiling results we ran on IBM Q, which I will skip. And uh, let me just ask Davide, I'm getting close to the hour. How much more time should I, uh, should I take before questions? I think it's good to finish close to the hour. I think we have other folks typically run away to other meetings and things. <laughs> okay, good. So I'll just spend two more minutes and then be open to questions. So let me talk about one more very interesting thing for NISC applications. Uh, you know, with, Google, with the Google chip at 53 qubits already, um, we're, 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 we're really striking at this regime where it becomes classically impossible to simulate the output of the circuit um, unless it's a highly structured circuit. Uh, so we're exploring these quantum computations in a complexity regime where we don't know what the correct solution is. And so there's an important I, important idea here, which is that we need to, to be able to have confidence in terms of how much can we trust the probability distribution we got out from the chip when we can't measure or pre-compute the exact probability distribution classically. And so what I'm gonna tell you about today is a way we can bound the precision of the output probability distribution by running diagnostics on the hardware. We call this QCAP and it's bounding the circuit accuracy for some algorithm on noisy hardware. So if you're trying to measure the binding energy of some protein and some ligand uh, for an application, uh, the quantum computer will give you an estimate of that binding energy. And if it says it's you know, 13 millihartries, the question is, is it 13 millihartries plus or minus 10 millihartries, or is it 13 millihartries plus or minus 0.1 millihartries? So we're, we're addressing that question. And so here what we do is, we, we look at every chip in the IBM five qubit family, which are the ones that are available to us. And we look at every possible clock cycle that we can run, hard gate clock cycle on those chips. And then we measure the total process infidelity of each of these, of each clock cycle on each chip. And so we say basically on the Burlington chip, if you're running this C naught gate, your total error budget across the whole chip, including crosstalk, is, um, is worse than 10% error. On the Vigo chip, it's, um, it's around, uh, what is that, uh, 2%. So massive, one order of magnitude variation in the performance. All of these chips were generated by the same fab process. But I think, I don't know this for sure, but I'm guessing that the fab process uh, doesn't carefully control the frequencies you get. And so that's why you get such different performance. And then if you look within a given chip, you can again say, well, what's the total error budget for the different uh, hard gates, the different C naught gates uh, that we can do on that chip and measure that as well. The amazing thing is running this diagnostic 
is constant in the number of qubits. The complexity of doing this depends only on the distinct number of hard gate rounds you want to characterize, which is polynomial by construction for running an efficient algorithm. And then once you have this information, then you can say, you know, um, Jonathan Carter wants to run this algorithm on that chip. It has this circuit structure. Here are the different hard gate cycles he's going to use. Here are the different relative frequencies he's going to use for that application. And then with this data, which we can measure, which constant overhead, which is amazing, we can then say, well, here you go. Here's your total error budget on that chip for that application. So we can say, if you run that application on the Vigo chip, uh, if you, as you vary the circuit depth of that application, here's how you're, here's the, this error bar is an error bar on the bound of the uh, error on the probability distribution. So remember, we're talking about the total variational distance as a measure of how close is the experimental probability, probability distribution to the true one. We're assuming we're in a regime where we don't know what the true probability distribution is, which is true for some of these experiments we can run on, on Google's 53 qubit chip. And then the question is, how much do I trust the accuracy of the solution? Well, here's the answer. Run our diagnostics, and if you're running circuit depth 20 with this combination of clock cycles, you can say, at worst, I have a 40% chance of getting the wrong bit string out, which means, which basically is an error bar on how close my probability distribution is to the true one. If I run that on the Burlington chip, I've saturated, I basically get, I'm getting total nonsense out of the chip. Uh, so uh, basically, once you tell me what the error budget is, now, of course, that probability distribution will translate to something like maybe the width of that probability distribution corresponds to your uncertainty on estimating the binding energy of some process. And so you have to convert this information into the information of interest. But we now have a pathway to doing that. And I think I will end on that note and be happy to take questions. I will skip the slides about how we can do better error correction which is an important story. Let me give a shout out to the Quantum Benchmark team that developed the software system. Uh, we have four people full-time working on this. And of course, Joel is the, is the CTO of that process and I'm the chief scientist behind it. And then let me also give a shout out to the Berkeley team, which has been wonderful to work with uh, on this collaboration. And with that, I will end and take questions. Okay, we will have a round of virtual and actual applause for uh, Professor Emerson. For your the new talk. reality. That's right. Also thanking Sarah Morgan for setting up uh, today's seminar. Yes, so thank you for with, your patience with me. Uh, thank you. So with that, I think the floor is open for questions. We could raise hands, uh, but let's just start by, uh, you go ahead and put out the questions out there. If we have a lot of network collisions, we'll, we'll go to raising hands uh, on the thing. So floor is open for questions. So, so I have a question on QCAP. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, like, there have been a lot of uh, uh, metric, I would say, developed by IBM and Google. I'm um, thinking of like quantum volume and uh, cross entropy bench, like cross be cross entropy benchmarking, right? So they seem to measure exactly what QCAP is measuring, like roughly. Uh, can you just explain a bit more why it's oh, oh it's oh is it different? Uh, yeah, I'll mention a few ways. A few ways it's different. Um, so let me just first put my cards on the table and mention a caveat, which is um, this only works. Oh, excuse me for that. This only works under the assumption that you do not have significant non-Markovian noise on the time scale of two clock cycles. Okay, so that's the first. Now that all that assumption is implicit in like Google's uh, Google supremacy experiment because they have to do this inference with these elided circuits and so on. Uh, the second thing I'll say that's a key differentiator um, is that remember what we're doing here is we're characterizing each clock cycle and looking at the total error budget and then we're assuming we can add these up and that's the Markovian assumption. The point, the key differentiator here is that QCAP, the name comes from quantum capacity for hardware to perform a specific application. That's what AP stands for. So the point is the supremacy experiment is you're running a random circuit. The quantum volume experiment is you're running a random circuit. So they're really just useful as generic benchmarks of performance. They are not useful in telling 
a user, a quantum chemist or material scientist who's running a specific application, how much can I trust the precision of the output for my application? And so the key piece here is we're saying, tell us what the application is. We'll break that down into you're doing, you know, you're doing 10 of these, you're doing five of these, you're doing three of these, you're doing 15 of these clock, uh, these circuits, these specific clock cycles in your application. And then we can add up the error budget for each of those. And remember, this is all in the context of running this with randomized compiling so that what we're measuring via cycle benchmarking has the same random twirls as when you're running the application. So you get that gap is closed. And that means we can actually tell you the error budget based on the specific application you want to run. So sorry, that was the short answer. We give you the error budget for the specific application as opposed to just a generic benchmark. Okay. That, that yeah, was yeah that's, that makes sense. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Okay. Okay. Other questions for our speaker? Yeah, I, I have one question. Um, so we usually use this TVD metric to benchmark um, randomized compiling. But this also depends on being able to compute the, the ideal probability distribution. Yeah. And so what happens when, when this is intractable to compute with larger systems? Yeah, yeah, that's exactly right, Akel. So, Akel. So basically, um, the point, like our experiments, what we're doing right now, what we see it as is we're developing an understanding of uh, when randomized compiling helps and how much it helps. And uh, the point is, in the future, when we're running circuits on 100 qubit chips, we're not going to be able to know what methods are helping and what methods are hurting because we don't know whether we're getting closer or further away from the correct solution because we don't know the correct solution. Now, of course, we could run uh, trivial circuits like Clifford circuits um, where we do know the correct solution and do checks that way. Uh, we could run, you know, Shor's algorithm type solutions where uh, you, can, you can, in polynomial time, check if the solution is correct. But for most applications of interest, say to the DOE, um, you know, you're not gonna know the correct answer ahead of time. And, and so I feel like what we're doing right now is developing a theoretical understanding of the kinds of gains you can get through randomized compiling when we do know the correct solution. And that will then be a guide for, um, you know, when and how to use randomized compiling in the context where we don't know the correct solution. And then also to tie your question into what Alexis was asking about, um, that's the point of validating this. So when we make a figure like this, remember this is a bound and the bound assumes you don't have significant non-Markovian error, which is pretty much the elephant in the room for all the science we do around quantum computing. But the other piece is that we don't know if this bound is tight. So it could be that you're actually this close, you know, you're down here in accuracy, but the bound says we don't know if you're any better than that. And so one of the things I think we should explore actually is how well does this bound work? And that would be a great kind of next project is to say, the bound tells us we can guarantee you're at least no worse than this, but in practice, are you a factor of two closer? Are you only, you know, 5% closer than the bound? So you know, is the bound a, good, a tight bound or is it a loose bound? That's something we don't know the answer to and would be very interesting to explore. I'll, I'll add a neat picky comment to what you said. Uh, you, you said that most problems of interest to the DOE, you don't know the answer. I think most problems of interest in general, you don't know the answer to. <laughs> oh, sorry, you're right. I, I, I chose my words wrong. You can't check the answer is the way I should have said it. I, I'm thinking of Shor's algorithm where you can check the answer. Um, but yeah, yeah, but the, the important thing is not checking the answer. It's factorizing when you don't know. <laughs> but I, I stand corrected, Davide. <laughs> no, sorry, I just like to be nitpicky. <laughs> okay, I do too. Other questions? So maybe let me just ask one uh, final question on the, the point that you just raised on how tight is this bound. So if one was to think about you know, sort of getting a more realistic sense if you were to run a particular algorithm, let's say a VQE algorithm or something else 10 times, see what your error is. 
how would you sort of go about doing that? This is sort of constructed by looking at sort of some global combination of gate sequences. Do you look at sort of what the susceptibility is to certain types of errors or how does one start to think about adding some more tightness to this bound? Yeah, I think, um, I think tightness to the bound, well, here I'm giving away some, some new ideas. Well, but so don't give them away for sort of going too deep. But. So we have some ideas about tightness to the bound and it's actually closely related to what Alexis has been looking at uh, um, around the rescaling, the normalization. Um, they're related to that. It also has to do with looking at more, I mean, remember what's this bound from? It's looking at the total process in fidelity across all the qubits, which is basically, if you think about the heat maps I showed earlier, we're just summing over all the terms in that heat map and saying, here's the total error budget for that operation. But actually we have all that fine grain information available too. And so we can probably tighten the bound by, by doing a more careful analysis around how that information will propagate on the structure of the circuit. It's yeah. very speculative. I don't know how it'll work out, but ultimately what we need to do is do experiments and see um, as tight as we can make the bound, we'll, we'll work on that theoretically. But ultimately the point is, this is just saying uh, you're off by no, by no worse than this amount. And it's a question of just checking experimentally on these, on these small test beds when we do when we are able to know exactly what the circuit ideal output should be, let's just right. see how close it is. Yeah, well, that starts to make sense. And I think that was sort of what I was hinting at with susceptibility. If you shake the trunk of the tree, you want to see how many leaves move and you sort of go from, from tree, to, tree to tree in the forest to get some aggregate number uh, that's there. Okay, any last uh, comments? We're at uh, 30 minutes past. Okay, if not, let's thank our speaker once more. I uh, wish everyone a uh, healthy day and, and a good weekend going forward. Thanks to all of you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye-bye. Take care, everyone. Stay healthy.